Mankind has perhaps pondered its own mortality. From the very moment the early human species that gave way to Homo sapiens acquired the cognitive ability to ponder their own existence. The various prehistoric monuments located throughout the world are a testament to mankind's desire to make a lasting visual mark on Earth for future generations to gaze upon. Even if these cryptic monuments were never intended to glorify the pursuit and attainment of immortality, their enduring nature within the minds of people today gives the people who constructed them a kind of incorporeal immortality. Soon after mankind invented writing systems in the cradle of civilization, there arose texts outlining mankind's desire to defeat death. The earliest of these writings is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which also bears the distinction of being the earliest known work of literature. Written in Akkadian, the epic poem talks of an ancient Mesopotamian king named Gilgamesh, who ruled over his Uruk subjects oppressively. The inhabitants of Uruk called to the gods for help, whom answered their pleas by sending a wild-looking man covered in hair named Enkidu. This man was intended by the gods to confront Gilgamesh and end his oppressive ways, but when the two met, they found that they were equally powerful and became friends. They then set off to fight a demigod named Humbaba in order to acquire fame, and in the process they swiftly slayed the god. Angered, the gods caused Enkidu to die. Despite having only known Enkidu for a short period, Gilgamesh was overwhelmed with grief and began to greatly fear for his own life. Gilgamesh then left his kingdom and set off on a journey to meet Utnapishtim, who was known to have been granted immortality by the gods after having survived a great flood. Faring himself across a sea, Gilgamesh made landfall on an island and finally met Utnapishtim, whom he told his story and intentions to. Utnapishtim tells Gilgamesh that eternal life was bestowed upon him by the gods after surviving the great flood. Gilgamesh was undeterred and questioned him further, which prompted Utnapishtim to request that Gilgamesh stay awake for six days and seven nights. Gilgamesh failed the test and began to leave the island in disappointment, having neither conquered sleep nor death. As he was about to leave, Utnapishtim's wife convinced her husband to give Gilgamesh a farewell gift. Utnapishtim told Gilgamesh to swim to the bottom of the sea and retrieve a particular plant that had the power to restore youth. Gilgamesh immediately weighed his feet down with stones and then plunged to the bottom of the sea and plucked the plant. Bringing it up to the surface, he vowed to test its powers upon an elderly man once he returned back to Uruk. While resting on the way back home, a serpent ate the plant, and as it slithered away, it shed a layer of skin, confirming the plant's rejuvenation powers. Gilgamesh was overcome with grief and returned to his kingdom of Uruk empty-handed. As the murk of semi-historical mythology gave way to historical fact, one has the ancient Chinese emperor Qin Shi Huangdi and his endless quest to attain immortality. Perhaps one of the most powerful men of ancient times, for having been the first to brutally unite much of what makes up modern eastern China under one state and one leader, Qin Shi Huangdi became increasingly obsessed with finding an elixir of immortality as he grew older, so that he could rule indefinitely. To Qin Shi Huang, the only way his dynasty would last and for the various states he had conquered to remain under his sway was if he lived indefinitely. During this time, Qin Shi Huang hated even being around people who talked about death, and even went so far as to forbid his court officials to discuss the topic. Conversely, he took the various tales he heard of immortal beings and herbs and elixirs granting eternal youth and immortality very seriously, and left no stone unturned in pursuit of these stories. Many alchemists gave him potions promising they would grant eternal life, but they did not make him feel younger, and likely only sickened him. He made three trips to Jufu Island, based on a legend that there arose a mountain there that held an elixir of immortality. Incredibly, his presence on the island is forever felt, as he inscribed two lines of writing upon stones on the island, which can still be seen today. Tapping into the vastness of his young empire, Qin Shi Huang made a royal decree, asking for the entire empire's help in acquiring the elixir of immortality. 
Thanks to the highly efficient bureaucracy that Qin Shi Huang had developed, the decree rapidly made its way to all corners of the empire, even to frontier regions and remote villages. Most villages replied back periodically telling Qin Shi Huang that they had not found an elixir yet, but other towns such as one in modern-day Shandong province in eastern China suggested that herbs found on a nearby mountain might hold elixirs of immortality. On another occasion in 219 BC, Qin Shi Huang sent off his court alchemist Xu Fu on a seaborne voyage in search of a mythical realm called Mount Penglai, where food and drink was said to be boundless, and trees bore fruit that could grant eternal youth. Additionally, atop Mount Penglai, there dwelled several immortal men, including a 1,000-year-old man by the name of An Qi Sheng, who also held the power to render himself invisible. Qin Shi Huang claimed that he met An Qi Sheng himself during his many travels throughout his kingdom and spoke with him about immortality. Aboard Shu Fu's ship were hundreds of young women and men, some of whom were craftsmen. This expedition did not find any such realm and came back to Qin Shi Huang empty-handed. Perhaps fearing the consequences of failure, Shu Fu told Qin Shi Huang that a giant sea creature had blocked the path of the ship and that they would need archers on any subsequent attempted voyage. In 210 BC, Qin Shi Huang granted Shu Fu's request, and Shu Fu was then off on his way once more. This time around, Shu Fu never returned, and word of their eventual whereabouts were never discovered. Legend has it that Shu Fu was fearful of the consequences of a second failure, and decided to colonize whatever lands he made landfall upon. Historians theorize Shu Fu could have colonized Japan. During this same period, Qin Shi Huang burned vast amounts of books and persecuted scores of scholars in an attempt to erase all evidence of the past that could be used against him. Some have theorized that Qin Shi Huang may have also wanted to get rid of all other distractions and have the best minds of the times focus their energies on immortality research. In 211 BC, a large meteor descended from the heavens and splashed into the lower sections of the Yellow River in Dongjun. Soon afterwards, people in the area noticed the words, the first emperor will die and his lands will be divided, carved upon a stone. Qin Shi Huang sent people to the region to investigate the traitorous prophecy, but no one would admit to having carved the stone. So in response, all those living near the stone were executed, and the stone itself was destroyed. In 210 BC, during a tour of the eastern part of his empire, Qin Shi Huang became gravely sick in Pingyuan Jin, which is in present-day Pingyuan County, Shandong Province, and soon died at the relatively young age of 49. Historians have theorized that the various elixirs he had been drinking in his attempts to attain immortality had gradually sickened him, or that he had drank an elixir that one of his alchemists had either intentionally or unintentionally placed excessive amounts of mercury into. Over the ensuing centuries, various Chinese emperors have also searched for an elixir of immortality. Chinese alchemists worked tirelessly during these centuries, working with toxic chemicals like arsenic and mercury on a regular basis. Though they never found any elixirs in the process, they did accidentally invent other more useful chemicals such as gunpowder and sulfur. The Chinese quest for immortality eventually diverged into two paths, both of which were heavily influenced by Taoist philosophy. During the 2nd century AD, during the Eastern Han Dynasty, the school of the external pill taught that the consumption of fluids was the pathway to immortality. Conversely, internal alchemy taught that dietary choices, respiration exercises, and meditation could induce immortality. Throughout the Middle Ages, alchemists in Europe also sought ways to attain an elixir of immortality. However, due to the alchemists' use of mysticism that predated Christianity, their activities were often frowned upon by the Catholic Church. As a result, the alchemists had to perform their work in secret and shrouded their work in coded language and symbols so that only an outsider could understand them. They didn't view their work as blasphemous, far from it, as they in fact thought that they were on a quest to unveil hidden truths about reality that were being either intentionally or unintentionally obscured by the Catholic Church. However, the most sought after concoction for the alchemists was not an elixir of immortality. 
Instead, they were after something called the Philosopher's Stone. This unknown substance was seen as a catalyst that could turn relatively common chemicals like mercury or copper into valuable ones like gold or silver. Likewise to the elixir of immortality, the Philosopher's Stone, if ingested in small amounts, was theorized to be able to restore youth, extend one's life beyond the natural boundaries, and bestow outright immortality. Though nothing of the sort was found, the alchemists throughout the centuries and across the continents did unwittingly and gradually lay the groundwork for the scientific method and modern scientific thought, and eventually the modern scientific disciplines of chemistry, metallurgy, and pharmacology. By the end of the 19th century, science was not specifically looking for elixirs of immortality anymore. However, the truth scientists did uncover while researching the various complex ways that nature assaulted the human body led to longer and healthier lives in the developed regions of the world. People wishing to improve their chances of survival now knew what the primary life-shortening culprits were from nature, namely disease and bacteria, and could now for the first time in history ingest medications that were more likely to help them rather than to kill them. Soon enough though, philosophers and scientists began to apply scientific modes of thought towards the pursuit of immortality. The sensibility was widespread, but it was perhaps embodied most prominently within the Russian Empire and the early Soviet Union among a group of people whose movement became called Russian Cosmism. The intellectual movement drew upon philosophy and religion to explain humanity's origin and evolution, and emphasis was placed upon explaining what humanity's future within the cosmos would be like. One of the earliest proponents of this school of thought was Nikolai Fyodorov. Though he did not perform any experiments or get death-fearing rulers to ingest mercury, he laid the ideological groundwork for Russian cosmism and for seekers of immortality in the latter half of the 20th century. In 1924 in the Soviet Union, the physician Alexander Bogdanov began a series of experiments involving blood transfusions, with the goal of restoring youth, or giving eternal youth. Many volunteers participated in the experiments, even Lenin's sister Maria Ilyanova participated. Bogdanov even used himself as a subject, carrying out 11 blood transfusions on himself. By all accounts, Bogdanov was very satisfied with the work he did upon himself, as he thought that his eyesight had improved and that he stopped balding. Leonid Krasnin, a friend, noted that Bogdanov appeared 7-10 to 10 years younger after the transfusions. Based on these successes, Bogdanov in 1925 established the Institute for Hematology and Blood Transfusions. In 1928, he injected the blood of a disciple of his who was afflicted with malaria and tuberculosis, and died shortly afterwards. In 1937 in the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin directed state funds towards a laboratory in Georgia run by pathophysiologist Alexander Bogomolets. This research facility was to study the extension of human life expectancy. Sources are unclear of Stalin's intentions, but perhaps like Qin Shi Huang from 2,000 years ago prior, he too wanted to rule indefinitely, and greatly feared death. Soon afterwards, Bogomolets developed the drug anti-recticular cytotoxic serum, hoping that it would enable people to live to 150 years. The drug did not dramatically extend the lives of people as intended, but it proved very useful for treating numerous diseases and injuries, and saw heavy use in Soviet hospitals during World War II. After the war in 1946, in a laboratory of his among the ruins of Kiev, Ukraine, Bogomolets told foreign reporters that a man should normally live up to the age of 150 years, if they were to use the drug he invented once their connective tissues began to wear out. To Bogomolets, aging and death was brought about by the deterioration of connecting tissues between the body's organs, and that this could be fixed by two to three shots of ACS, which would create protective cells to stop deterioration. In the decades after World War II, numerous studies were done to better understand why and how the process of aging happened. These studies focus on how cells are involved in the process of aging. Even though these efforts were a far cry from Chen Shu Hong's grandiose searches for an elixir that would grant himself immortality, they helped lay the scientific groundwork for the visionaries and scientists of the late 20th century and early 21st century who would approach the topic of aging with the express goal of extending human lifespan. As opposed to Chen Shu Huang and his mercury-laden alchemists, these visionaries and scientists would be equipped with several decades of modern scientific research. 
In 1945, Danham Harmon proposed his free radical theory of aging. When a human body intakes oxygen, its bodily systems break the oxygen down into free radicals. Additionally, exposure to stress or toxins in the environment can cause free radicals to be produced. Free radicals are molecules or atoms that have an unpaired electron. Electrons normally come in pairs. The molecule or atom with the unpaired electron will go to great lengths to acquire another electron, which will cause it to take away electrons from other cells nearby that are made up of paired electrons. As electrons are stripped from molecules, these molecules in turn become unpaired, and therefore free radicals. This process can lead to an endless chain reaction, which will soon disrupt a vast amount of molecules in the body and any cells that they may be a part of. This disruption of the electrons that make up the atoms and molecules of cells can damage and destabilize them. Once the free radicals reach a certain amount, the body's natural counteracting defenses will be overwhelmed, and oxidative stress will then generally be placed on the cells in the body, which is a situation that can lead to a host of age-related diseases, such as heart disease and cancer, and a general accelerated aging of the body. Researchers think a human body that wants to maximize its lifespan and good health needs to maintain a certain balance between the inevitable creation of free radicals and the antioxidants that can render them harmless by avoiding lifestyles which lead to the creation of too many free radicals and by eating foods containing antioxidants. Found in a variety of foods, antioxidants are the primary component that maintains the balanced amount of free radicals, as they are ingested matter that can render them harmless by passing on electrons to them. According to some researchers, one needs only to consume more antioxidants. However, over the subsequent decades and going into the 21st century, the free radical theory of aging has come into question. In 1957, George C. Williams proposed his antagonistic pyotropy hypothesis, which attempted to explain the aging process using evolutionary biology. Pyotropy is when a gene controls more than one aspect of that person's body, such as two different organs. Antagonistic pyotropy is when one of the consequences from the gene's control of multiple bodily functions has a negative effect on one's body. Animals and humans have genes that increase their potential to be able to reproduce, but at the same time in the later stages of the organism's life, these genes decrease reproductive potential and lead to aging. These genes that eventually lead to aging are passed down to children because the forces of natural selection are so strong in the early life cycle of organisms when they are in their reproductive prime. During the 1950s and 1960s, various scientists began theorizing about the effects that accumulated and unrepaired, naturally occurring damage on DNA have upon the aging process. They first drew a distinction between DNA damage and DNA mutation. In DNA mutation, the DNA is altered in such a way that the cell permanently rewrites its genetic code. In some cases, this can lead to the cell becoming unable to die off, as it no longer has the coding to be able to do so. With the dying off process bypassed, the cell can then become cancerous and replicate itself endlessly, crowding out all other healthy cells and the functions they provide. DNA mutation often occurs in damaged cells that replicate, such as stem cells. On the other hand, unrepaired DNA damage in non-replicating cells such as those found in the brain often lead to crippled cells with weakened functionalities, which in turn leads to aging. DNA is left unrepaired by the body if its natural repairing mechanisms are overwhelmed. Natural processes both from within the body and outside the body can lead to DNA damage over time. Within the body, the simple act of processing incoming oxygen is continuously damaging DNA. However, the body is able to repair most of this damage, but some damage inevitably sticks and accumulates over time. In 1961, Leonard Hayflick disproved previous theories that human cells were immortal by indicating that they are only able to divide themselves about 50 times. Each X chromosome in a cell has four caps called telomeres on each end of the X. During each division of the cell, these telomeres shorten. When there are no more telomeres left to shorten, the cell will stop dividing forever. After this limit is reached, called the Hayflick limit, the cells enter a stage that Hayflick calls senescence. 
When the cells reach this phase in an organism, they no longer can divide and renew themselves, but despite this, they do not die completely. Instead, they continue functioning, albeit in a weakened state, that leads to signs of aging in an organism and more susceptibility to age-related diseases. In 1985, scientists discovered telomerase, which is a ribonucleic protein that makes telomeres long again. Telomerase was found to be naturally present in reproductive cells and in cancer cells. In 1993, scientists doubled the lifespan of the roundworm C. elegans by partly turning off a gene. Not only did the roundworm live much longer than its documented lifespan, but it remained healthy and active. The experiment proved that the process of aging can be altered in a laboratory condition. Applying the 1985 discovery of the telomere lengthening ribonucleic protein named telomerase, in 1998 in a laboratory setting, scientists increased the lifespan of human cells beyond their Hayflick limit using telomerase. By the 1980s, many of the sentiments and beliefs of those who researched and philosophized upon the process of aging and life extension began to coalesce into a single ideological movement called transhumanism, which seeks to promote the improvement of human beings by inventing and making widely available sophisticated technologies that can extend life and cognition. Individuals describing themselves as transhumanists began to gather at the University of California, Los Angeles. An Iranian-American who adopted the name FM2030 to better reflect his transhumanist outlook on life, lectured on transhumanist topics at UCLA. During the same time frame, Natasha Vitamore showed an experimental film at the EZTV media venue at UCLA, which depicted a future of humans transcending their biology and colonizing the stars. Soon enough, FM2030 and Natasha Vitamore began collaborating by organizing transhumanist events, whereby their students and viewers would gather together. In 1992, philosopher Max Moore founded the Extra P Institute, which was a nonprofit educational organization, which served as a means for transhumanists to network and to discuss how transhumanism is defined. The Extra P Institute was instrumental in spreading transhumanist ideals throughout the internet's early days, during the early 1990s, as it had an extensive email list that was made known to all members. Out of this growth of the transhumanist intellectual movement came the World Transhumanist Association, founded by philosophers Nick Bostrom and David Pierce, which is an international non-governmental organization that strives for getting the world to see transhumanism as a legitimate area of scientific study and public policy. In the early 2000s, this organization further refined the definition of transhumanism by declaring that it is defined as an intellectual and cultural movement that acknowledges the possibility and desirability of improving humanity through applied reason, such as by inventing and widely disseminating technologies that will eliminate aging and vastly upgrade the intellectual, physical, and psychological capabilities of humans. Additionally, the organization strives to study the potential negative consequences and benefits that may arise from technologies that enable humanity to transcend natural biology. The establishment of transhumanist thought in the 1980s and 1990s gave those who sought immortality in the modern era an ideology to rally around and a tool to help make sense of their ambitious goals and desires. It would also serve as inspiration for the Seekers of Immortality, who now had an entire movement, with its attendant ideology, to use as a tool to help flesh out the feasibility of their visions. To many philosophers and scientists seeking and desiring immortality, there were now no limits to humanity's potential to transcend its natural biology. By the turn of the 21st century, research into life extension began to rapidly increase. In 2003, Aubrey de Grey, an author and biomedical gerontologist, and David Gobel, an inventor and entrepreneur, established the Methuselah Foundation, which is an American nonprofit whose mission is to make 90 the new 50 by 2030. They aim to achieve this by funding the development of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine therapies. The organization is named after Methuselah, who was the grandfather of Noah, and according to the Hebrew Bible, lived to be 969 years old. The foundation actively invests money in young companies involved in the life sciences, funds scientific research, and provides prize money to anyone who achieves certain goals outlined by the foundation. 
Though life extension research has long been seen as a realm of pseudoscience, the Mesusela Foundation was instrumental in changing the public and scientific community's opinions on it, because as of the creation of this video, life extension research is now a mainstream talking point. During the late 1990s and the 2000s, inventor, author, futurist, and computer scientist Ray Kurzweil wrote several books espousing transhumanist ideas and views. Books like 1999's Age of Spiritual Machines, 2005's The Singularity is Near, and 2009's Transcend, Nine Steps to Living Well Forever, were pivotal in bringing the idea of life extension and immortality out of the territory of pure pseudoscientific quackery and into the forefront of the minds of adventurous scientists who would go on to start life extension research companies. Additionally, Kurzweil is famous for his lifestyle, which includes taking 150 pill supplements a day, and which is scientifically engineered towards extending his life for as long as possible, such as only eating certain foods and engaging in regular exercise. In 2013, Google created the Calco company, which has the stated goal of using advanced technologies to improve the understanding of the biological workings behind aging in humans. Likewise, the company uses whatever knowledge it gleans from its research to try to develop treatments that may allow people to live longer and healthier lives. In 2014, Calco publicly informed investors that it would be teaming up with AbbVie, a pharmaceutical company, to research and develop treatments for age-related diseases such as neurodegeneration and cancer. Within the partnership, Calco provided cutting-edge technology and computing services, while AbbVie contributed scientific, clinical, and marketing support. Altogether, both companies have spent over $1 billion on the venture. It was determined that Calico would tackle aging from two different angles. One division of the company would focus on looking for cures for all the major age-related diseases, while the other division would focus on understanding the root cause of aging, and therefore eventually be able to develop methods to slow or halt the process altogether. Over the years, Calico has closely studied the lifespan of animals, to learn why some of them live significantly longer lives than humans. It was discovered that there is a direct correlation between animals who reach reproductive maturity late in life, comparatively speaking to humans, and longevity. For example, the bowhead whale which inhabits the frigid waters north of Alaska does not reach reproductive maturity until the age of 25, while their average life expectancy is over 200 years old. Additionally, nutritional lifestyles of animals like the bowhead whale, which can go months without needing to eat, were shown to give way to longevity, which clearly indicates a correlation between caloric restriction and longevity. Reaching reproductive maturity and constant eating accelerates aging in animals, but in certain environments where food can be scarce for long periods of time, evolution will naturally select animals that are able to survive for extended periods with little to no food. So essentially, the lifespans of the bowhead whales are moving at a much slower and spaced out pace compared to animals that eat on a daily basis. So therefore, bowhead whale lifespans became extended to account for the long stretches of time in which there is no food to go about. What astonished Calco scientists even more was that the bowhead whale seemed to be healthy until the very end of its long lifespan, with no signs of cancer or dementia. In 2016, computer scientist Daphne Kohler joined Calco with the title of Chief Computing Officer. She realized quickly that the way the body and the aging process works on a molecular level will likely never be solved just by human investigative work alone, due to the incomprehensibly vast amount of data and influencing factors involved. It was decided that creating algorithms may be the best way to process and make sense of the bodily processes. Calico and Kohler's goal were to figure out the absolute root cause of the aging process. To figure this out, she knew she needed to pinpoint what the cause of the process was down to the molecular level, which is the realm involving individual genomes and proteins within a human body's cells, arteries, and organs. Kohler predicted that Calico might be able to find between 1 and 5,000 genetic alterations that directly lead to aging. After this discovery, the goal would then be to find a genetic pathway that would allow for an ageless and indefinite lifespan, and then develop treatment plans that would allow people to align their bodies with the genetic pathway. Despite new discoveries on the processes of aging, and some promising news of prototype drugs for cancer going through clinical trials, many feel the amount of money invested in life extension companies has not justified their output, while more aggressive seekers of immortality such as Aubrey de Grey think they put too much emphasis on aging research. A mere few months after Google launched Calico, another life extension research company called Human Longevity Incorporated was launched. 
Though it didn't have the vast financial resources of Google at its disposal, it was still infused with hefty investments from numerous big figures in Silicon Valley. By the mid-2010s, life extension research companies began cropping up all throughout Silicon Valley, with names like Verily, Unity Biotechnology, Unite Therapeutics, Alkahest, Stemcentrix, and Neutrobox. Looming over all these lesser-known companies were big players like Calco, Human Longevity Incorporated, and the SENS Research Foundation. What all these companies had in common was that they wanted to approach searching for life extension techniques with the mindset of a computer programmer by collecting vast amounts of genetic data and then figuring out how to decode and hack it all on a molecular level so as to gain an understanding why each unique human individual ages the way they do and as a result, what can be done to halt or terminate the aging process compared to traditional industries like the pharmaceutical industry who are content from a business standpoint to merely only treat ailments silicon valley is highly motivated to invest vast sums of its own money towards companies it created that focus on life extension research there is also a general spirit among many in silicon valley that there is no problem that is too difficult or too vast for it to tackle or to solve these companies want to get at the root cause of every ailment that can appear in each unique human individual by completely understanding genomes Despite the human genome being completely mapped thanks to the Human Genome Project in 2003, there is still a general lack of understanding of what all the data means. Silicon Valley aims to attain a near total understanding of all this data, so people can receive medical care that can preemptively solve every medical issue that can arise in them, before they start producing symptoms, and therefore enter the point of no return which may require debilitating treatments such as chemotherapy. To Silicon Valley, this would entail analyzing that person's genetic information and making near-perfect predictions what kinds of diseases that person could develop down the line. Human Longevity Incorporated offers a very expensive service called the Health Nucleus that allows customers to undergo an extensive battery of medical scans and tests, ranging from brain scans, MRIs, and blood withdrawals, over the course of eight hours with the purpose of gathering every conceivable piece of information regarding an individual and their health. The intent is to catch certain health issues long before they would have normally been detected, so that the customer can take preemptive measures. Sometimes when a health issue enters the detection phase and symptoms start appearing, it is too late to cure the person, and doctors can only treat and alleviate symptoms. The health nucleus treatment has already improved the lives of countless people, who for example have discovered tiny tumors that had evaded the detection methods of their traditional doctors, which they were then able to get removed before they reached unmanageable sizes. By 2015, many scientists and organizations began to seriously debate categorizing aging as a disease, rather than simply as a facet of life that needed to be just accepted without question or reason. Seekers of immortality are strongly in favor of aging being classified as a disease, as in their minds it would prompt pharmaceutical companies to invent life extension therapies, and in the United States, this would in turn get the Food and Drug Administration to regulate life extension therapies. Without the disease designation for aging, life extension therapies are classified as cosmetics, and as a result there is little quality control on the sometimes harmful products in the industry. In 2019, the World Health Organization in its International Classification of Diseases, a healthcare classification system, began to indicate whether or not certain diseases had a relationship with the aging process. From this point onwards, the World Health Organization considered the aging process to be a major underlying factor that increased the risk of developing diseases, increased their seriousness, and increased the difficulty of treating them. As of the creation of this video, life extension still only exists in theory. Nevertheless, the developments of the last 25 years have given rise to the following theoretical methods to extend the human lifespan. Periodic replacement of damaged tissues, molecular repair or rejuvenation of deteriorated cells and tissues, reversal of harmful epigenetic changes, and the enhancement of enzyme telomerase activity. The periodic replacement of damaged tissues would require something called tissue engineering, which is also known as regenerative medicine. Tissue engineering is the creation of workable human tissue from cells in a laboratory setting. The method has the advantage of being able to not merely just treat and alleviate ailments, but to cure them, as it would involve the replacement and repair of tissues and even whole organs that fail. The cells from which tissues and organs can be created from can either be extracted from the afflicted organ or be grown from stem cells. Another hypothetical life extension method is the molecular repair or rejuvenation of deteriorated cells and tissues using molecularly precise machines that are measured in nanometers. For scale, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter, which is roughly equivalent to the length of five carbon atoms placed next to each other. 
These machines could have molecule-sized parts, made of some durable diamond-like material, that work in the same way as macroscopic gears and motors. The machine could use manipulator arms to adjust targeted areas of a human body. Altogether, a nanobot would likely be around 2 to 3 microns in size, as red cells are about 7 microns wide. A micron is a unit of measure equal to 1 millionth of a meter. Theoretically, the nanobot would be able to find bacteria, viruses, fungi, and cancerous cells in the human body and break them down into harmless materials that the body can then readily process without harming itself. The precise nature of potential treatments is boundless, as theoretically nanobots could be used to manipulate the inside of individual cells. For example, a nanobot could take out chromosomes from damaged cells and put new chromosome material into it. This new chromosomal material could be grown in a lab, using the patient's own genetic material. As DNA damage is known to be a key factor of the aging process, nanobots could also be able to fix the genetic damage within the cells. The main issue standing in the way of the creation of nanobots is the current inability to create a functioning machine at the molecular scale, which requires a level of precision beyond what current technology allows for. Another theoretical life extension method is the reversal of harmful epigenetic changes in the body. Epigenomes determine which genes are accessible to be read by the body. For example, genes can be made inaccessible for the body to read by the introduction of certain epigenomes to parts of DNA, which obstructs the body's ability to attach to the DNA and read the gene. Additionally, DNA typically wraps around proteins called histones. If the body places the histones close together, the body will be unable to access the DNA to read it. Conversely, spaced out histones will make it easier for the DNA wrapped around them to be read. Epigenomes attach themselves to the DNA and can influence the orientation of the histones, making genes inaccessible or accessible to be read, or they can also influence how the DNA itself is read or not read. According to David Sinclair, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, epigenetic changes are a primary cause of aging that are brought about by the body going about its day-to-day -day functions, continuously breaking and repairing DNA while reading it and expressing it. As these breakages occur, changes in the DNA structure in the chromosome can take place, which may allow a harmful gene to be read by the body and expressed. As for the feasibility of actually developing a treatment that can reverse harmful disease-causing epigenetic changes that occur in humans, much work needs to be done. However, it has been theorized that the treatment could be delivered as an injection, containing a harmless virus that has genes that can reprogram DNA. In conjunction with this, one would take an antibiotic pill that would then allow the reprogrammed DNA to be read and expressed. These are the treatments that have been given to lab mice by Dr. David Sinclair at the Harvard Medical Lab, which controlled the aging process and even cured blindness. But much follow-up work needs to be done to verify the experiments before they can be done on any humans. The final potential key to unlocking dramatic life extension is the enhancement of enzyme telomerase activity. Telomerase is a protein that helps keep telomeres long at the ends of chromosomes and cells. Telomeres are DNA sequences in proteins that protect the DNA in the chromosome from getting damaged during cell replication. These protective caps also shorten each time a cell replicates. When the telomeres get too short, the cells can either die or stop replicating, both of which prevents the DNA from getting damaged. But on the flip side, the ceasing of replication can lead to the development of cancers and tumors within the body. The shortening of the telomeres and the resultant death or the ceasing of replication of a cell is seen as part of the natural process of aging, as the non-replicating cells are unable to perform at their highest functional capacity for a human body. Human bodies have processes within its cells that are only capable of slowing, but not stopping the shortening of the telomeres. The aim of some life extension researchers is to lengthen shortened telomeres. However, this comes with dangers if cells that are compromised and harmful are given the ability to replicate indefinitely, and therefore possibly cause cancers. In December 2012, Kurzweil joined Google and began working on Smart Reply, which is an AI technology that reads people's emails and then comes up with potential answers for the user to use. It took nearly five years before the first version of the technology was launched. Though it may seem like a small endeavor, to Kurzweil and many others involved in the field of AI, it was a huge leap. Kurzweil envisions a future where every organ and bodily function can be replaced with nanotechnology, such as with nanobot cells performing all the normal functions a biological cell would, minus the negative features. To Kurzweil, not even the cerebral cortex would be left untouched, as he envisions the brain's neurons also being replaced with nanobot neurons that would be able to tap into an internet cloud, enabling the individual to instantly access information as quickly as one can think it. 
If this vision is ever realized, it may mark the end of humanity's quest for immortality, as according to Kurzweil, humans who adopt these changes would be able to make backup copies of their entire mind and body, with all its nanobots, which can then be downloaded and placed into another body if the previous body begins to break down. According to Kurzweil, this would put humanity on a path towards saturating the entire universe with its intelligence, which is a prediction that implies some sort of interstellar and eventually intergalactic form of travel being developed. In recent times, the amount of modern-day seekers of dramatic life extension and immortality, the modern-day Chin Chu Huang, so to speak, have increased greatly and now include numerous high-profile individuals. For example, the likes of Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates have donated tens of millions of dollars to life extension research companies and Alzheimer's research. In addition, the entire life extension industry is projected to be worth an astounding $64 billion by 2026. Perhaps with this growing interest in defeating mankind's age old nemesis, indeed also life's age old nemesis since the beginning of time, we may someday all live healthy and youthful lives eternally, and be able to explore everything this wonderful universe we inhabit has to offer, without death breathing down our necks at every turn. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed my documentary, don't forget to like and subscribe, and check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash world chronicles.